Good evening and welcome, saints. Welcome to our Friday evening Vespers. It is Sabbath here already, and I'm very grateful for the Sabbath hour. And I always am praising the Lord. I'm grateful that the Sabbath comes in because it's a time where I know I can rest from my weekly burdens of work, of business, of being responsible taking care of things that I don't want to by the end of the week. I'm absolutely drained. In fact, on Friday, I usually is the day where I say, I really want to close everything down and do nothing but the Lord's work. But I know that that time is going to come because, you know, God has really been moving on my heart and changing so much. And I'm grateful because I can sense the Lord's presence in my life and he's moving things around and I'm, I'm grateful for that. And I pray for every one of you that will be joining in that are going to watch the replay or that are watching now that you have the same sense as me. And this is what led me to choosing my topic for tonight, which is consider what's ahead. And if I have time, I will be going into the preparation for the final crisis. And I'm uh, grateful for the word of God, the instruction that he has given us through the word of God and through the spirit of prophecy that we might um, gain the knowledge and the understanding that we can be prepared and help others to prepare. I would like to open up with a word of prayer and ask the Lord to please be with me to lead to, to be my mouthpiece, I want to hide behind him and um, present him on every level to you. He's a wonderful, amazing God, and I just thank him for what he's been doing in my life. So let us close our eyes and pray. Merciful Father, thank you again, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father, for your mercy and your grace upon our lives, for your love and for your leading. I'm grateful, Lord Jesus, this last week you have shown me so much, Father. Starting last Sabbath, Father, you gave me some powerful reflections through the night. I could feel your presence. I could feel you woke me up and had me listen. And I'm grateful, Lord. I'm grateful for the dreams that you've given me, Father. I'm really grateful for especially what I've been learning, Father, this week as I've been praying and you've been sharing and showing me things. And I know there's no mistakes, Lord, that this time is short and you're going to be showing us all, Lord, through this time. So thank you, Father. And be with me as I'm speaking uh, to the Third Angels Ministry page through here, that everybody who hears this message, Lord, is going to find it useful and helpful. Father, I pray for all the students who have been learning. I pray for each and every one of them, a special blessing on them, their families. Please guide them and protect them. I know, Lord Jesus, many of them are under so much warfare, especially my beautiful brothers and sisters in Fiji. They contacted me today and shared again, Lord. They are so under fire. Father, that only shows me if they are so under fire that they are doing your will and your work, and I'm grateful for that. Thank you for their obedience. Thank you, Father, for being with us. Please continue to, to be with me now as I present this message in your precious and holy name. I am so grateful to you. I thank you, Father, and I pray, amen. So, saints, we are going to be talking a bit about what is going to be, what is ahead? We need to be thinking and looking at what is ahead. Um, sorry, I'm just making sure that the camera is straight. So I'm going to share a quote that is from the Spirit of Prophecy, early writings, that is, I believe, the foundation for what I'm going to talk about. She said, the Lord has shown me repeatedly that it is contrary to the Bible to make any provision for our temporal wants in the time of trouble. I saw that if the saints had food laid up by them or in the field, 
in the time of trouble, when sword, famine, and pestilence are in the land, it would be taken from them. Now, you've probably heard me give this quote before um, when I've talked about us preparing. She goes on to say that the food is going to be taken away by violent hands and strangers who are going to reap their fields. Then will be the time for us to trust wholly in God and he will sustain us. I saw that our bread and water shall be sure at that time and God and that we, pardon me, shall not lack or suffer hunger for God is able to spread a table for us in the wilderness. How beautiful is that? If necessary, he would send ravens to feed us. Does that sound like a familiar story that we've heard? I believe Elijah, that was what happened to him. And of course, she says, as did as he did to Elijah. Or remember, he rained manna from heaven as he did for the Israelites. That was found in early writings, page 56. Saints, has God fed his people in special times of need before? Absolutely, I named twice. Did he feed his people for 40 years when there were no stores to buy from? There was no place to grow any food out in there in the desert. Did they get along all right? Absolutely, they certainly did. Did he feed Elijah? Absolutely. What water was there for Elijah? There was a brook. And did Elijah find it okay to be fed by the ravens and to have the water from the brook? But then the brook ran dry, so there was no more water. But did the Lord then send water for him to drink? Correct. And then what happened? He then sent Elijah over to a widow. I'm sure many of you remember the story. Now, I want you to imagine having to go to a widow's home to get something to eat. And when you get there and you look at how much she has, you are shocked. Just enough meal to make one little meal. That's all she had left. And for the woman and her son, that was it. Nothing else. But on that little bit, it was multiplied by our miracle working power of God. She and her family and the prophet, her family being one son, lived for how long? Read the story. It's an amazing story. Um, so we're going to go through a very similar experience to Elijah's saints before we go through the final act. Do you remember the last thing that was recorded of Elijah? He was translated. Is that right? He went to heaven without seeing death. And hopefully that is going to be the experience, or not hopefully, surely that is going to be the experience of the remnant church, the remnant people. And won't that be wonderful if you and I can make it? I want to ask you something, friends. Would you be willing to go through a time of famine and stress as Elijah did and be fed miraculously and not know where your next meal is going to come from? Would you be willing to do that? Well, that's what's ahead of you and that's what's ahead of me during this time of boycott as the persecution is going to become greater and greater. Now, I want you to write some of these Bible verses and check it out. Isaiah, the 33rd chapter. If you note the preceding verses to Isaiah 33, it's the time when the sinners in Zion are afraid uh, the devouring fire is at work and the everlasting burnings are manifest. But the 15th verse says that the man who walks righteously turns from all sin, shuts his ears from hearing of sin and shuts his eyes from seeing sin. The 16th verse says, he shall dwell on high. His place of defense shall be the munitions of rocks, of 
and bread shall be given him. Now that's familiar text. We've covered this many times. And the water shall be sure. And that's Isaiah 33, 16. You know, Moffat translates it as in a stronghold on the cliff, secure his bread provided and his water sure. Has God promised us bread and water? Oh, yes, he did. Somebody says, but he hasn't promised us ice cream. He hasn't promised us cake through that time. Are we going to need that? Saints, do we need bread and cake? I mean, not bread. Do we need cake and ice cream? We certainly don't. But we won't need that then. We don't need it now. He promised us our needs. And many people mix their needs and their desires up. I know that my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. That's Philippians 4.19. You see, then we have a promise of miraculous feeding here. Bread shall be given him. His water shall be given. And that will be sure. And notice it's up in the mountains, right? And he shall dwell on high place of defense. Shall be the munitions of what? Of rocks. And this is the way... Um, the wilderness, the, no, the, the Waldenses, who remembers, not in the wilderness, but the Waldenses, how they went through that terrible time of persecution in the dark ages. And the remnant people of God, some of them are going to be brought into that time. Now we know that there's a little bit of preparation that is needed. Houses and lands will be of absolutely no use to our saints in that time of trouble for they will we are going to have to flee before infuriated mobs and at that time their possessions cannot be disposed even um, so that is why we are shown everything needs to be done prior Sister White says, it was shown that it is the will of God that the saints should cut loose from every encumbrance before the time of trouble comes and make a covenant with God through sacrifice. Early writings, page 56. Saints, I'm at the stage where I'm ready to sacrifice everything. I personally would love to sell my whole home, my everything, get rid of all my clothes, my possessions, and just enough clothes for me to wash and wear. I'm ready for that, saints, and I'm ready to do it now. So I'm praying for that, and I'm praying that there's two of us, my husband and I, that he can be on board with me so that we can minimize and we can come down to nothing and that we can just get minimal just a block of land with lots of water. That's all we need, saints, and I'm ready for that. I want to ask you something. Looking at this time of trouble when the plagues will be falling, will it be possible for us to hold on to our houses, our land, and use them to solve economic problems? No. No. Not at all. It's not going to be possible. Some of us are thinking of other statements and we're going to look at, we're going to look at a lot of different statements that we're given. But just now, I want us to fix our eyes on this great time of trouble during the time when the plagues are falling. I want us to think and reflect about this because just before Jesus comes, when the wrath of all the world is against the remnant church and they're attempting to force God's people to take that mark, what's going to happen? They have passed the death decree and this economic pressure is increasing and increasing. There's a very interesting message on this that I want to share with you. And this is the letter that the Lord's Messenger, Sister White, wrote to Elder Butler and Elder Haskell on January the 20th in 1884. That's a very long time ago. I know, saints, but we need to pay attention to some of these things that were written. Elder Butler was the president of the General Conf Conference at that time. Now, pay close attention, saints, to these few lines as I'm going to share them with you. Friday night, several heard my voice exclaiming, Look, look, 
the time of trouble was upon us. I saw a people in great distress, weeping and praying, pleading the sure promises of God, while the wicked were all around us mocking us and threatening to destroy us. They ridiculed our feebleness. They mocked at the smallness of our numbers and they taunted with words calculated to cut deep. They charged us with taking an independent position from all the rest of the world and they had cut off our resources so that we could not buy and we could not sell. And they referred to our object poverty and our stricken condition. I want to ask you something, friends. Do you think there's an air-conditioned Pullman between here and the Holy City? What do you think? Are there going to be some troublous times? Notice those last words, abject poverty, she said, and stricken condition. I wonder what it's going to be go, to be to go from expensive homes lavish furniture that many people have in their homes that have cost thousands of dollars just for one couch and into this experience that I'm talking about. I wonder what it's going to be like, saints. I wonder if we need a bit of weaning period, a bit of a time that we can get used to this that we can wean ourselves off the finer things that we have and we own. Because many of us, we are so used to lavish homes, we can't bear the thought of being in a two-bedroom home. It's just too much for us to even imagine being on a little tiny property in a two-bedroom little shack. I wonder what it's going to be like. I wonder if we need time to, to reflect and get into this. I'm going to study that with you in some future lessons. But just now, I'm looking at the ultimate during this great time of trouble. When the plagues are falling down and everybody's in strife. They are charged as with taking an independent position from all the rest of the world. Remember those words? And they had cut off our resources, Sister White said, so that we could not buy and we could not sell. And they referred to our what? She said, our abject poverty and our stricken condition. Well, I wonder if we want to go to that road, if that's what's ahead of us. Saints, I want to go onto that road. You know, this is no new territory for me. I was born in Africa, I was brought up in Africa, and uh, not in great poverty. However, I remember very difficult times. And saints, I remember many people who were living in poverty, and how my mom used to help everybody on the farm. And I was so little and young, but I was thriving on seeing these people so happy. Those who love Jesus enough to make any sacrifice will want to go with him to the end. Do you want to go with Christ to the end? You remember when the Savior was here? He selected John and Peter and Andrew, Matthew and Thomas and the rest of them. He asked them to leave what they were doing. Can you remember that? And he said, come and follow me. And one of them finally betrayed him. But the other 11 followed him all their lives. All but one of those died a martyr's death. Peter was crucified, if you can remember the story. James was beheaded and the others were killed in other ways. They filled up their lives with service for Jesus and then crowned the life of service with a death of suffering. Would you be willing, saints, to follow Jesus if that's what it means? I've often thought about that. And Matthew 10, 37 to 38 says, He that loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that takes not his cross and follows me is not worthy of me. 
Saints, we may all sleep in comfortable beds tonight, but some of the last nights we spend in this world will be spent either on the coal floor in dungeons or out in the caves of the mountains or the desert. Do you want to take this road, saints, or would you rather take a detour? You have time to change your mind. I know that I am not going to detour, saints. I have some precious truths to give, and I'm going to follow this road. We shall probably all have a good breakfast in the morning, right? With anywhere from half a dozen to 20 things to choose from. But at the last meals we take in this world, if we're following the pathway of the remnant, all we're promised is bread and water water saints so it is time to get rid of all of those luxuries i suppose most everybody today owns a vehicle a motor vehicle some own two or three our home has two four-wheel drives we have two um trailers and we have a, a big caravan but I want to tell you something, friends, saints, the last trips we make in this world are not going to be in any of those vehicles I've mentioned. They'll be like the early church took their trips. How did Jesus get from Galilee to Jerusalem? That's a long way, saints, he walked. And how did the early apostles travel as they went from city to city to see nation to nation preaching the gospel of Christ and healing the sick? How did they get there? They walked. I ask again, friends, I wonder if we need a period of preparation. This is a burden that I have on my heart that we all come to the understanding and the, the preparation time that we need to go from the soft and easy life that we live in. Did I say easy life? Yes, I did, saints. This is a very easy life. Some of us have lost jobs because of the, the, the mandate. However, you still have beautiful homes, you still have vehicles, and you still have money in your bank accounts, and you're still able to get from A to Z. It's certainly soft. Some things about it are very hard, I know. Sometimes we look at the cost of fuel. Sometimes we look at the cost of the living. But because the soft life that most people are living now has a lot of worry and tension in it, I know people are thinking, but it's a hard life. Saints, it's not a hard life. We must think about our friends, our brothers, our sisters in Africa. Think about our friends in Asia, in Pakistan, in India. They having difficult lives. In the most combination of the lack of physical exercise and the great increase of mental, mental tension is causing ulcers, high blood pressure, uh, coronary heart attacks, and many other conditions. And so really, it isn't the sacrifice that it seems when the Lord is calling us away from that life of luxury, saints, and ease and softness. And he warns us that we had better be getting ready for something more strenuous physically and yet friends a life for which we trust god now don't you think we'll need some trust in god to leave our comfortable homes and the trail for the mountain or the des the desert why it it would scare some people to death to even think about this why would any sensible person leave a comfortable home and start out for the wilderness saints ask my husband I've said to him time and time again, let's sell up and let's go in a caravan. Yes, it's still comfortable, but it's a mini home, saints. I'm ready. I'm ready for that and to go into the wilderness and teach and preach in the wilderness where they do not have the luxury of teachers. We have many teachers here in Perth, but there are a very big shortage of teachers out in the wilderness, and I'm ready for that lifestyle. He would rather do that than take the mark of the beast, saints. And you read there in Revelation 13, there is coming a time when the only people that will be allowed to buy or sell are those with what, saints? Those who take the mark of the beast. And the message of God says, if you do that, 
then you're going to be turning your back on Jesus. Oh, friends, these are real things. These are practical things. I pray that every one of us will be among the survivors, those that win with Jesus. Instead of going down in destruction with the enemy for a short time, this world will seem to have things going their way for a short time. The dragon and the beast and the false prophet will seem to have everything cemented and only a little remnant as a fly in the ointment, but that is but the dark hour that comes just before the dawn, because when the world thinks that it has settled the fate of Jesus' people and condemned them all to death, then Jesus is going to come and he's going to put an end to all Satan's plans. Now, when we resume this survivor study, saints, I want to study with you God's plan for the intermediate period. In fact, it is now uh, seven o'clock. I've still got a half an hour. I may go across to that. Um, and that is the narrow way I've called it. So let's continue on. While at Battle Creek in August 1868, I dreamed of being with a large body of people. A portion of this assembly started out prepared to journey. We had heavily loaded wagons. As we journeyed, the road seemed to um, ascend. And on one side of this road was a deep precipice. And on the other was a very high, smooth, white wall. As we journeyed on the road, it grew narrower and narrower and steeper and steeper. In some places, it seemed so very narrow that we concluded that we could no longer travel with our loaded wagons. We then loosed them from the horses and took a small portion of the luggage from the wagons and we placed it upon the horses and journeyed on horseback. And saints, I want you to reflect. My big question before was, is it time to start getting onto this narrow road and start dropping your luggage and taking smaller portions? As we progressed, the path still continued to grow narrower and we were obliged to press close to the wall to save ourselves. Imagine walking on a precipice that thin and this side has a massive drop and this side has a wall that's shiny and smooth. You can't climb that wall and if you go that way, you're going to fall. Are you going to go back, saints, or are you going to keep going forward? This was another vision Sister White had. And they realize, saints, uh, Sister White in her vision says, as we did this, the luggage on the horses pressed against the wall and caused us to sway toward the precipice. So we feared that we should fall and be dashed into pieces on the rocks. We then cut the luggage off the horses. What happened? There was now no more luggage and it fell over the precipice and we continued on the horseback, greatly fearing as we came to the narrower places in the road that we should lose our balance. And what would happen? They would fall. At such times, a hand seemed to take the bridle and guide us over the perilous way. And as the path grew more narrow, we decided that we could no longer go with safety on horseback. Saints, are you seeing what's going on in Sister White's vision? She started out where they had lots of luggage and carts, chariots, they dropped it all. Then the horseback and then they had to leave more and then they had to get off the horses back. And they left the horse and they went on foot in single file. They couldn't walk in twos. They had to walk in single file, one following the footsteps of another. And at this point, there were some small cords that were let down from the very top of the pure white wall. And these were eagerly grasped to aid us in keeping the balance upon the path. And as we traveled, the cord moved along with us. So they were walking forward and the cords were going forward with them. They had no shoes, so they were slipping. Um, um, the, um, what did she say? Sorry. 
they couldn't the path finally was so narrow that they concluded that we could travel more safely without shoes, she said. Uh, so they slipped their shoes from their feet and they went on some distance without their shoes on their feet. And soon it was decided that it could travel more safely without their stockings because the stockings were slippery and they had to remove their stockings too and they journeyed on with bare feet. We then thought of those who had not accustomed themselves to privations of hardships. Where was such now? They were not in the company. Saints, they were unable to make this journey because they were not dropping their provisions. And at every change, some were left behind. And those only remained who had accustomed themselves, they, themselves uh, to endure hardship. Are you ready for hardship, saints? The privations of the way only made these more eager to press on to the end. And that story is found in the Testimonies for the Church, Volume 2, pages 594 and 595. A beautiful story. Please find it and read it. Read the entire dream that Sister White had. It is so interesting. But I want you to notice in what we have to read the very different things starting out with. Remember the loaded wagons and then just wagons and then no more luggage, then just horseback and then no more horses and then finally no shoes, no stockings. So this is, saints, what we need to start thinking about. Are we ready for this trail, saints? Are we ready to go on foot? Because only those, she said, who had accustomed themselves to privations and hardships were able to go on. There is going to be a problem of economic survival in the crisis. We spoke about that about 15 minutes ago. And this is what is awaiting God's people. And during the great time of trouble, when the wicked have cut off all the resources, God's people cannot buy, they cannot sell, and a death decree is hanging over their heads. Angels will feed God's people, bread will be given, and water shall be sure. But this does not mean there will be all the comforts that we are used to, saints, or the conveniences that we are used to. There's not going to be great varieties of food that we are used to now. Saints, we have seen this twice through the word of God. If you can remember, during the Exodus, they were fed the manna from heaven. They did not want the manna. They cried for the meat. They cried for the, the meat they were used to, and Christ gave it to them. But remember what happened after that. Many were killed. Will you be there, saints? Will you be among the people of God when they are out of the mountains in the de or in the deserts, in the swamps or in the dungeons awaiting the coming of the Redeemer? Will your children be there, saints? Are you preparing for this, saints? I have asked this question many times before. Will a life of ease and comfort best prepare us for that time? It is not a fair question, but it's a very pertinent question to ask. You know, when men are being trained in the army saints, they don't go for comfort. The military is hard. They are preparing them for combat in the most difficult of places. They take them into the jungles, into the desert where it's hot, and they're wearing their uniforms with their military boots, and they're running through the desert. And you hear when you're watching on um, the, the, the documentaries, they're running and they're singing, I am going to do, 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 do. It's saints, I don't know about you. I, do, I know that I couldn't run in the middle of the desert with a military uniform and big military boots on um, with the pour, sweat pouring off me and told I cannot have water till my commando in officer says I can have water. 
The government is not going to say, oh, you poor souls, you need um, a very comfortable hotel room because you're going into war tomorrow. I don't believe that has been the case in any military or war. No, saints, real mercy and compassion means that the man who's going into a hard situation will have some preparation for it, which is reasonable. And as Stephen says, and a safety, a 60, pardon me, pound pack on their backs as they're running, saints, it is time to prepare. We don't have to have a 60 pound pack, but when that time comes that you are moved with no vehicle, with nothing, saints, the least you want is a small backpack with a bottle of water, saints, that's when you are out on your last because we are going to be treated so poorly. Now, will God who sees the end from the beginning leave his people without a plan of preparation today? Absolutely not. And before we reach the great time of trouble, we're going, we're going into the little or the short time of trouble first. And that's when the boycott is going to begin and we cannot buy or sell from that moment. In that intermediate time, saints, between now and that great time of trouble, we won't be, we won't be under a death decree, but we will be under the squeeze of economic pressure. We found that the angels feed God's people during the falling of the plagues, but I have not found the promise that the angels are going to feed us during those early stages of economic pressure. I have not found that anywhere in the Bible. Um, and I've been studying with an amazing evangelist and he states that too. And I asked the question, are we not going to be taken care of? And the answer is no. So let's take a look at what does Revelation 13 say concerning that boycott. He causes all, all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond to receive what? A mark in their right hand or in their foreheads right? And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark. That's Revelation 13, 16 to 17. So how are we going to live through that time, saints? What will you do? Now, somebody says the angels are going to take care of us. The way the angels are going to take care of us to give us some good sense, get ready for that time. That's what the angels are going to do. They're going to help to give us good sense. The time is fast approaching when the controlling power of the labor unions will be very, very oppressive. Are the labor unions among the agencies along with church and state that are going to bring the Sunday law? Most definitely saints. Let's see what the pen of inspiration had to say. Again and again, the Lord instructed that our people are to take their families away from the cities into the country where they can raise their own provisions for in the future, the problem of buying and selling will be a very serious one. Selected Messages, book two, page 141. Now here are some very clear instructions, plain as the English language can make it. Ahead of us, it says, it is a very serious problem, saints, concerned with buying and selling. It is so serious. Did we read that in the Bible? Yes, we did. And in anticipation of that time, the Lord's messenger says that the counsel from heaven is that our people are to do what? To move out of the cities and get into the country where they can do what? Raise their own provisions for in the future, the problem of buying and selling is going to be an extremely serious one. I could close the study right now, saints, but I just want to add because I believe we've been given enough to think about right there. So I could close off right there. But 
I just want to go a little bit further and I want to share some references with you to meditate upon. I want to look at an extremely important example that we've been given. God's message is practical and he gives us practical instruction. Back in the days of Noah, the Lord sent a message that there is going to be what? A flood. Water is going to cover the whole earth. Did he say just preach and wait? And when the time comes, the angel's going to carry you all on their wings above the rain and you can be up there on the clouds until the flood is over. He did not say that, saints. There was something very practical that he gave Noah. Noah not only preached, he practiced. And in doing it, he did what God told him. God told him to build an ark. And Noah built an ark. And the ark, of course, was to float upon the water. And thus, those who entered would be saved. Now, we are told that the storm was so terrible that the ark would not have been able to withstand its fury except by the miracle of God's working power. Well, if God had to work a miracle to preserve the ark and those in it, why go to all the trouble of working 120 years to build it? Why not devote all that time to preaching and save that time was used in building the ark? Couldn't God have preserved them some other way? Why? Of course he could have. He's God. He can do anything. But you see, God delights to give his people a plan. And that was the plan that he gave Moses at that time. And the plan that he gives is something for them to do, to show their faith by their works. Faith is believing God. Amen. And faith is not inventing some method that we think will take care of the problem. Faith is in humbly kneeling at the feet of Jesus and saying, Lord, you see the future. What do you want me to do right now? And I believe God has told you what you need to do now. I shared with you what's coming. And that was our first 30 minutes where I spoke about... Um, what is going to happen in that little time of trouble and what is going to happen in the greater time of trouble. And then I went into giving you the practical application that was given to Noah and that has been handed down to us. What did Sister White say? Get out the cities. That is the message for our time, saints. Get out of the cities and prepare because the crisis is coming. We need to lay up our gardens and get our food provisions ready for that little time of trouble. But after that time, God is going to move his people away because Sister White explained extremely well that what will happen is that food that we lay up is going to be taken away. So there's no need to be preparing for that time of, um, of trouble because that is when Christ is going to do for us as he did for Elijah and as he did for his people when he took them on the Exodus trip, 40 years through the desert. Trust and obey. There's no other way but to be happy in Jesus is to trust and obey. Saints, I don't know about you, but tonight I'm feeling a special excitement in my heart as I know that we can actually get up and go anytime. And we can move into the wilderness and teach and preach and help others there. And I'm truly ready for that, saints. 
And I'm hoping that some of you are ready for the same thing. As a matter of fact, since 2012, I've been urging all my students back then to buy caravans. And actually, some of them did take um, my advice and they have bought caravans. And they also took my advice and have moved into the country. And so they have country properties and caravans and they feel like... You know, they're ready, they're ready. They've got their provisions, they can come and go. They can go out into the wilderness and teach. They can travel through country towns, which we are going to be doing very soon um, because uh, we're ready for it, saints, we're ready. And uh, I pray you are too. And if any of you are, are willing and want to get on the road and travel with us, we're happy for that, saints. We're ready, we're ready to go. So let's get on board the ark and let's do what Noah did. Let's be a Noah and save our families. For some of us, it's a bit late. I know. However, I have faith and I believe maybe we think it's late. I say it's late because my children are now adults. But you know what, saints? God can do anything and he can bring those children out of the world. And I praise God. I have one son who has come out of the world and he is now so interested in becoming an evangelist. I am praising God and uh, he messages me every day and talks to me every day and asks me questions every day. And he is studying so hard. He is such a good son and saints, my ch other children are good children. I love them. I love them all equally. But I am praising God for my son that has come to the Lord and saints, all of us should be praying for our children now. And for those parents who have little children, remember that's your mission, that's your ministry. Don't let God down the way I believe, I feel like I did. Hold on to those little kids and bring them up in the way God wants you to spare the rod and beat the child because that's the only way the Bible says to bring them to Christ. So I'm grateful for those of you who've joined me and for those of you who will listen to the replay. I'm going to now close in prayer. I'm truly, truly excited by what's, by what's coming, what's happening. And uh, I look forward to seeing some of you who are going to be joining us um, over the Easter weekend as we camp. I'm especially excited for the meetings that we have planned and we are planning still and preparing. And uh, I look forward to the cooking that we're going to be doing together. I look forward to all the medical missionary training we're going to be doing together, the hands-on stuff, praise the Lord. You know, saints, I always have said, it doesn't matter how many we are. The church is where two or more are gathered in Christ's name. That's the church. We all have churches we go to, but sometimes we congregate in small groups and that is the church where two or more are gathered in my name. Remember saints, God is awesome. He's given us a brilliant church. The Seventh-day Adventist church is the church that's going to go through. So let us stay faithful to the end. Let us stay faithful. Thank you so much for listening. God bless you all. And I'm going to now close in prayer. Heavenly Father, I'm so grateful. I'm thankful to you, Father, for the many blessings that you stored upon us. Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us into this movement, Lord. What a powerful movement, Lord. Over 170 years ago, you gave us a powerful, powerful prophet who did not even go to school. And we can see her writings are incredible. And we know just by that, that this is the prophet you gave us. And her dreams, her stories, her letters, her books are all incredible and amazing. And Father, if people don't want to follow the spirit of prophecy, I don't understand but I'm grateful for all her teachings that I put into practice. Thank you for the practicalities of the Bible, the practical training you give us through our great leaders ahead and before us. Thank you for Noah. Thank you for Elijah. Thank you for Moses. Thank you for Daniel. Thank you for Joseph. Thank you especially for you, Jesus Christ. May this prayer reach you in the most holy place of your heavenly sanctuary. And Lord Jesus, be with 
every Adventist as they are preparing for this crisis because the enemy is on our cases. We can see, we can feel, and we can hear the warfare is thick and strong, but I'm grateful for you and you are covering us. In your precious and holy name, Father, we're so thankful. I pray, amen. amen. God bless you, saints. God bless you. Be faithful to the end. Don't let go. And remember that narrow road, saints, you are going to start letting go of that luggage. You're going to have to, saints, please let go and let God. And I am so looking forward to speaking to you all again um, Sunday, Sunday, 4 p.m., I believe I'm speaking to you all. So thank you again. God bless you, saints, and I will see you soon. Good night. God bless you. Bye-bye.